We considered the question, and we already know the answer, don't we? Who keeps the record? So if you'll, we'll go put on your safety belts, and we're going to go very quickly through a review because I do want to come all the way through this morning. Uh, we considered the question, who keeps a record of, of our sin? And some of the verses we looked at, Romans 3.23, we know for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Your pastor has. The great apostle Paul has. The, your church leader back at home that you admire and look up to so highly, he has fallen short of the glory of God, has sinned. All of us have. But we know also, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, this is from last week, he's faithful and he's just. He will forgive our sins and he'll purify us from all unrighteousness. And then the price that God chose to pay and that Jesus freely gave to pay for sin because it's serious um, and it comes at a high cost and that's from Ephesians 1 7 he's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and he forgave our sins you know so often when we read about God's grace to us and his forgiveness I want you, I encourage you to do this when you read scripture pay attention and you will see so so often that the Bible talks about the grace of God and the forgiveness of God in terms of great bounty in terms of great abundance towards us, towards us. And it says he was so rich in kindness and grace. And that encourages me because I need kindness so much. I need so much grace, not just a little bit, right? We need a lot. And God is so rich in that. And, it's, and it talks about in Ephesians, he freely gave and he abundantly blessed. And so we see that and that brings us confidence. And yet, as we saw last week, we count ourselves in the company of David, the writer of so many of the Psalms, after he had sinned, after he had deliberately, he'd committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he had planned a murder. If David were living in most countries in modern day times, David would go to prison and he would probably receive the death penalty. Rightfully so, rightly so. Uh, but we see, what does he say in Psalm 51, 1 through 3? His prayer to God, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. And again, want to encourage you as we come to God and as God deals with our sin. What does it say? Do, does God deal with us according to the depth of our repentance? Although he wants real repentance from us. Does God deal with us according to how good we are? Or church membership? or how, much, how many offerings we have given, how much we have given to Him, or, or how sorry we feel for what we have done. No. The basis of God's mercy for you, the basis of God's forgiveness for me, is because of who? According to your unfailing love, love that never fails, it never stops. Doesn't that encourage you? It encourages me. It's because of God and because of His love. Wash me, cleanse me from my sin. And then the line that speaks to our hearts, the chap in, verse, uh, in, this, in this psalm is verse 3, when he says, For I know my transgressions. And my sin, it's always before me. It's always before me. And so often we struggle with that, even as Christians. But I want to say to you this morning, if you are sitting here, I, and I don't know, your, some of you, I don't know your lives, but if you are perhaps a churchgoer or you're just visiting, visiting today, and you would say, no, I'm not really a Christian. Well, I believe in God, but really I don't have His life in me. This message is for you today as well. It's not just for the, those of us who are Christians and who are following God. I'm gonna, we're going to talk about wonderful things, the wonderful freedom we have from guilt, from shame, and from our past when we come to God. What a, a wonderful, wonderful message for each one of us. And so as we look at this, when David says, my sin is always before me, we have number one, the easy answer. Who keeps a record of sin? We keep a record of our sins, don't we? We keep a record of our sins. And we remember them so very well, don't we? I don't know about you, but I remember at times my sins and my shortcomings far better than the good things that I've done to people or for people. Have you ever done that? 
so many of us has have, and that's so often the way that it is. We keep a record of our sins. Now, in just a minute, we're going to talk about the enemy, but I want to tell you something. We, in our own human, thank you, Jean, all those things that are that are right there. We, in our own humanness, keep a record of our sins. But as we're going to talk about in just a minute, there's another one who keeps a record of our sins, and that's the enemy. But the enemy will never come to you sounding like the devil. He'll never sound like the enemy when he comes to you in your ear. He's going to sound like you, and it's going to feel like your own thoughts and your own thinking because he's a deceiver, and we'll talk about that. But we do, without any help from the devil, we often keep a record of our own sins, don't we? We really do. But I want to remind us again this morning of the truth of God's Word. Always, when you struggle with things, come back to the Word of God. Come back to the truth of God. And we look at our past in the light of God's grace. We look at our sins in the light of God's grace. And what do we see when we consider Paul? What did he say? 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. Here's his record. I persecuted the church of God. But then what does he say? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. I was praying about this this morning as I was driving into church. And I've told you before, I have to be a little bit careful um, when I'm driving and praying as I come to church on Sunday mornings. And the Lord just made that real. And I started thinking of my own past at times, before I became a Christian and even as a Christian, the times when I have failed. And the Lord, oh, He's so, so, so good because the Lord's grace in our lives and I want us to understand this this morning. The Lord's grace in our lives is redeeming grace. Redeeming grace. It is renewing grace. It, it, takes, it makes things new. It redeems what was broken. It redeems what we think has been lost. It redeems what we feel it's completely wasted. But it's redeeming grace in our lives. And Paul talks about that in his own life. And then he talks to the Corinthian Christians, remember the church at Corinth. Corinth was a really ungodly city, very immoral. All sorts of things were going on. And then he talks to these Christians at Corinth in the same letter where he talks about his own past. Look at what he says to them in 1 Corinthians 6. I don't know if you've ever made the connection before. Would you like to go to this church? Think about it. This is part of verse 9. Uh, for, uh, is it... Uh, 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians? I'm not sure. Double check. This is 2 Corinthians. Double check for yourselves later, not now. 1st or 2nd. Julie, tell us. Is it 1st or 2nd Corinthians? She's got her Bible open. 9 through 11. Somebody tell me. I want to get the... It's 1st? First. First. Okay. First. Just take off that. It's 1st Corinthians. And so he's talking to the Christians at Corinth, and look at what he says. He says, those who indulge in sexual sin, they worship idols, they commit adultery, they're male prostitutes, they practice homo homosexuality, they're thieves, greedy people, drunkards, abusive, cheat people. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Now let me ask you something. Those are really bad people. Aren't you glad that they're not in the church? Next verse. What does he say? Some of you were once like that. Ah, some of you were once like that. But you were what? Cleansed. You were what? Made holy. You were what? Made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. When these things come to mind, our pasts are always in the light of grace. They're always in the light of grace. And this morning as I was driving in and I was praying, and I always, whenever I preach, I always want the truth of what I'm preaching. Lord, I always want it, I want it prayed in my own life. I want, it, I want it working in my own life. And I was thinking of some of my own failures of the past. And as I was driving along, the Lord reminded me. And I was like, oh, praise the Lord. You've renewed that. Lord, praise the Lord. You've restored that. Because that's what the grace of God does. Praise the Lord. You've redeemed that in my life. One of the best examples to me of this, uh, there are two examples. One's from the Bible and one is in Lighthouse. And to me, Paul is one of the best examples of this when we think about this because he was a murderer of Christians. He was a persecutor of the church. 
when God redeemed him and poured his grace out on him, what did God call Paul to do? Preach his gospel. Go to the very people that he had persecuted and be part of them and then proclaim the grace of God. That's in the Bible. There's one in Lighthouse as well. How many of you know our brother Andrew Chan? He's, he's usually, okay, second service usually. He's not here this morning. Here is this man. Andrew really doesn't speak any English. Not really, does he? Not at all. He doesn't speak any English. He's about 60 years old or so. Why in the world would God bring Andrew to Lighthouse? We are an English-speaking church, and when Andrew started coming, so that's why welcome to those who are French speaking as well. Because God brings people into his church and blesses the church and enriches all of us together. So God brought Andrew to Lighthouse. And at that time, we had no Chinese translation at Lighthouse. None. And Andrew would come and he would sit there. Was that right? That's right. And we can tell you more later the story. But God brought him. And at first, maybe we would think it was for Andrew's sake because Andrew and Christine, his lovely wife, were married in Lighthouse and we opened our, our doors and that's how they came into, into the church. But as the years have gone, do you know what I have seen? I have seen how much we have been blessed at Lighthouse because of Andrew and because of Christine. Here's this man, really doesn't speak any, any English at all. He's a Cantonese speaker. And, and you know, Pastor Renee and I are Mandarin speakers as well. And honestly, Andrew doesn't really speak a lot of Mandarin either, does he? <laughs> Andrew, Andrew is a Hong Konger. He's a Cantonese speaker. And God has brought him into the church. And this is what I see when I look at Andrew. What was his past? Who keeps a record? If Andrew had lived at that time, Andrew would have been right up in here in all of this. You know that, don't you? What was he for 28 years? A heroin drug addict. Hooked on heroin 28 years of his life. Wasted. Wasted life. Wasted. Broken. What did God do with him when he poured out his grace and forgiveness in his life? Brought him into the family of God, cleaned him up, and what does Andrew do now? And what has Andrew done for so many years? What does he do? He ministers to drug addicts in Hong Kong. He ministers to drug addicts in Hong Kong. And here we see the work of grace in a life. And this is what I think of. When I think of Paul, when I think of Paul, I think of Andrew. Because the grace of God in our lives with our past and what we have done and what we have been and how we have failed, God can take it because He's the God that can do anything and use anything. And He redeems. What does redeem mean? What does redeem mean? Buy it back. Gets it out of the devil's hands and into his, his hands. And God can do anything. So when you look at your past, let the Holy Spirit turn your thought to God's grace in your life. And let God redeem the past. Let God take care of that record. Let God use what has been broken in your life. Let God use what has been weak in your life. Let God use what has been a failure in his life for his glory, for his glory. For that is the type of God that he is. And that is the power of his grace in lives that come to him and are given to him fully in his hands. Praise God. When you remember your past and you remember your record, let the grace of God remind you of what he can do, what he will do in your life. Amen? Amen. 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 What else does God do? We see it next. He renews our minds. And this is why we need our minds renewed in Romans 12, Ephesians 4, Hebrews 4. And there are many, many more as well. Con don't conform to the pattern of this world. Get, let, be renewed by your mind. How are we renewed? The Spirit. I can't change my mind. I can't do it. But the Spirit can renew my thoughts and attitudes. And then how else? The Word of God. The Word of God renews. The Word of God changes. Changes us. And it makes us new. And as our minds and our thinking 
as it's changed, then our past is, it doesn't hold the power over us anymore. And we stop thinking, I am this, I am this, I am that. But our minds are renewed and we can come to what has happened in the past. And we can say, but God, you've changed me. God, you've made me new. Amen? And there are many, many more than this. But we are not the only one who keeps a record of our sins and of our wrongdoings. Who else keeps a record? Mm. We know this, don't we? Okay? Next, the enemy keeps a record. And guess what? The enemy's record is better than yours. He's got everything down there. Everything. Even some of the things that you have forgotten, he's got them written down. And more. So the enemy keeps a record because we have, he is opposed to us. If the enemy can ever keep you from coming to God, he will do that, won't he? He will do that. But then, if you are brought out of darkness and into light and into the family of God, do you know what the enemy will do after that? The enemy will work as hard as he can to render you and to render me ineffective unusable for the kingdom of God because we're so filled with guilt. I can't because of this. I'm unworthy. I can't. I was this. I was an adulterer. I was, I was this. I was that. And the enemy will come to us and will begin to attack us and he will do all he can to keep us from growing and prospering and enjoying the abundant life that God has for us in His family and is in His kingdom. That's what He will do if He can. But it will sound like our voice so, so often, won't it? But He will come to us and He'll begin to attack. And I'll tell you what else He will do. Sister Julie this morning gave the testimony of Helen in Wuhan that was struggling with high blood pressure. And she was worrying about it. And, as, and those of you, as we know, if you really start worrying about something, you start worrying about high blood pressure, what happens? It goes up. It does. It does. That's, it, there, there, is, there is that physical connection with the spiritual, the, the stress, the, the mental, the stress and the anguish as well. And the enemy will seek to rob you of the peace that you can have and that you should have in God. I want to tell you something this morning. Listen well and listen carefully. If this morning in your heart and in your thoughts and in your minds you do not have the peace of God but you are worried and you are tormented and you are thinking, but what about this and what about that? The enemy is working this morning and I don't say that to condemn you. I say that to unmask the enemy so that you can see and you can know the enemy is trying to rob you of what God has for you this morning. He is trying to, but you don't have to let him. And we're going to look at that this morning. I want to do one thing. And you know at Lighthouse, we don't, we don't talk about the devil a lot. He's real. He's there. He hates us. All of these things. But we spend a lot more time talking about God. And that's what we prefer to do. But I want to this morning just mention just a few things. As we talk about the enemy that keeps a record in our lives. And I want to remind you of something. And if you're taking notes, you can just go pop, 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 pop. I'll give you about eight things really quickly if you want to take notes. If you say, I don't have my paper handy, then you come back to the second service and then you can write it down in the second service. But I want to, for just a minute, to remind you of his character, his nature, and his purpose against God's children, especially in this area. Ready? Here are some of his descriptions. Number one, he's a deceiver. Is that one of his descriptions? Yes, it is. He's a de deceiver, so what is he going to do? He will come to you and he will work to fool you into believing something that is no longer true of you. What you were. He will come back to you and try to make you feel you are still that because he's a deceiver. That's what he does, number one. Number two, he is your, what does the Bible say? He is your adversary. What's an adversary? An enemy, someone who opposes you. He is your adversary. So when he comes to you, what you know is this, or when the voice that you think is your own, reminding yourself of your past, comes and grows loud in your mind, it is your adversary, so he is against you and he is not for you. 
He's against you and he's not for you. What else is he? Mm. He is, this talks about it in Revelation 12, I think. He is the accuser of the brethren or the saints. How many of you this morning, you're one of the saints of God? Raise your hand. You say, well, I don't feel very holy. Ah, doesn't matter how you feel. Are you a child of God? Amen. You're one of the saints. And the Bible says he is the accuser of the saints. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser to God. That's what it means first. Before God, he says, they are this, they are that, they are whatever. But you know what God says? They're forgiven, and it's under the blood of the Lamb. But then he accuses, and he comes to attack God's creation and God's beloved objects. And that's you, and that's, and, and that's me. So he's the accuser of the saints. What else is he? He is the God of this world. You know that? We've seen that. He's the God of this world, so what does that mean? He will do all He can to help you and make you, not help you, to make you, to hurt you, and make you think like the people of this world. And the people of this world keep a record. The people of this world say, you've done this, so you're not worthy. You can't do this, and you can't do that. And that is how He works because he's the God of this world. What else is he called? He is called the tempter. The tempter. And because he is the tempter, when he comes to you, what he will do is try to, to try to tempt you into failing and into falling, to move you to hopelessness, so that you will say, I can't because I'm weak in that area. I can't because I was this and I did this. I'll never be useful for God's purposes. What else is he? This is pronounced in more than one way. I say Belial, B-E-L-I-A-L. -E but some people say Belial. I say Belial. And do you know what? Belial is one of his titles or one of his names. And you say Belial. I've read that somewhere, but I don't know what it means. Do you know what it means? Do you know what it means? It means worthlessness. Worth, that's one of his titles. Worthlessness. So there's nothing out of him that comes that will be helpful or beneficial to you in any way. Any way. What else is he? He is a thief. That's what, he, that's what Jesus said about him. He's a thief, so when he comes to you, he will steal. He will work to steal your peace, your joy of salvation, and your confidence. And finally, although that's not a conclusive list, there are other things, but I've, we've given him enough time. Finally, he's a liar. He's a liar and the father of lies. So he will exaggerate your record, inflate your record, and he will tell you things about yourself that are not even true. Has the devil ever done that to you? Told you something about yourself? And he told you enough times and you started feeling, oh. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to you and you realized, that's not true. That's not true. That's a lie. God, in you I am this. Because that's who he is. You and I... What I've just described, you and I in and of ourselves, we are not strong enough to fight against the enemy. We're not. You may feel, oh, I can do this, I can do that. You're not strong enough. We have a powerful enemy. But praise the Lord, we do not stand alone against the enemy. Our God stands with us, and our God stands for us, and our God gives us His armor. We talk about it in Ephesians 6. And what does it say in Ephesians 6? And take up the what? The sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the what? Word of God. And you and I, we have the presence of God with us, but brothers and sisters, it is not enough to feel. Listen carefully, and I'm, I'm not preaching heresy. It's not enough to say, I have God with me. I have God with me. I will fight. I will stand. Yes, we have God with us, but God has also told us and has given us in His Word how we are to stand, how we are to be firm, and we are to stand with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And it's a mighty weapon. It's a mighty weapon through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the enemy attacks, and when the enemy keeps a record, you cannot stand in your own confidence. You cannot stand in your own feelings of, but I, I feel saved. You cannot stand in your own power or in your own strength. You will have to stand in the power and the strength of the Lord God Most High, who is the... the ruler and the leader of heaven's armies and you will have to take up the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. You will have to do that or you will not stand. You will fall. 
I have to do that or I will fall. And that's why, brothers and sisters, we've got to get into the Word. It's not enough for you to hear a preacher preach it on Sunday morning. And you know here at Lighthouse, we preach from the Word of God. We depend on the Word of God. We don't preach experiences, although we sometimes give examples. We don't preach stories, although we sometimes give stories. The foundation is the Word of God, for it is the only thing that is a sure foundation in our lives. And when we take up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of, the, Word of God, that is the truth that will defeat the enemy's lies. And if we don't do that, and if we don't have that, we will fall. We will be defeated. Now, let's take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Just a minute here, okay? Number one, I said he's a deceiver. But who is God? And let's do a quick comparison. What do we see? And I'm going to read from the message, which is a very, uh, we seldom use this paraphrase. But so the devil's a deceiver, but who do we have on our side fighting for us? James 1, 16 through 18. Dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Every desirable, beneficial gift comes out of heaven. heaven. The gifts are rivers of light cascading down from the Father of light. And what does it say about him? The devil's of a, a deceiver, but our God is what? There's nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. Nothing fickle. So do a comparison. Take up the sword of the Spirit. What's next? The enemy is your adversary. But who do we have? Some of these you're going to have to look up on your own. I didn't want to. If, we, if I do all of the scriptures, if I do all of the scriptures, then we'll, this sermon will go until 12 o'clock today. So you're going to look up some of them yourself, okay? So he's a deceiver, but James 1, 16, 18, God, there's nothing deceitful in him. The enemy who comes to you, who keeps a record, is what? He's an adversary, but I want you to compare the adversary to whom? What did Jesus say? And I don't think, I, I, I think I didn't use the, I didn't include the uh, scriptures, did I? I didn't include the scriptures, but you can go to John 14. And what, would, what does Jesus say? He says, I, did I not record it? Yes, yes, thank you. I didn't put it in my notes, but I did record it. Here we go. Okay, you've got your adversary, the devil, but look at John 14, 16, and 17. Jesus says he will give you not an adversary, but what? An advocate. An advocate. Not one who is against you, but what? One who is for you. One who is for you. Take up the sword of the Spirit. Comforter, encourager, counselor. He'll never leave you. And he leads into all truth. That's on the other side. What's next? The enemy is your accuser. The enemy is your accuser. But what do we see next? What's the next one? Uh, oh, sorry. Go back just a minute. I'm, I didn't. This one you're going to have to look up on yourself. I think this is in John 15. Jesus says to his disciples, what does he say? I call you what? Friends. I call you friends. So rather than an accuser, you have one who says, you're my friend. You're my friend. You're no longer slaves. You're my friend. And that's in John 14 and 15. What is the enemy? He is the God of this world. But we know he's the God of this world. But we are on the side of the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, who goes beyond this world and beyond all time and who was here before time began and throughout all eternity. And that is the God who fights for us. That is the God that we lean upon. When the enemy comes and he accuses, when the God of this world comes and says, think this way, we have on our behalf the one who is the Alpha and the Omega. Hallelujah and Amen. What else is he? He is the tempter. He is the tempter. But we are in, the next verse is now, a relationship with the one who strengthens us. Temptation is to cause you to get weak and to fall. But what do we find out about God? He's faithful. He will what? Strengthen you and do what? Guard you from the evil one. 1 Peter 5.10, what else will he do? Rest, uh, back. Back. Okay, restore, support, strengthen, and then what will he do? <sighs> place you on a firm foundation. He'll place you on a firm foundation. C 
Compare that to the tempter. And that's why, brothers and sisters, you've got to get unto the Word of God. That's why you've got to pick up the sword of the Spirit. You know what I mean. The Word of God. Because this describes our God. What is His name? Belial. Worthlessness. But... Who do we have on our side? 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. The treasure of heaven. This describes the, the worth of God and there's, of Jesus and there's so many more. It's not just mere gold or silver. Oh, we think gold and silver are so precious. But it was the precious blood of Christ. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Compare that to Belial. The one who comes and says, you are this, you are that. But the sinless, spotless one who is the treasure of heaven says, I have redeemed you. I have washed away your sins. I have bought you with my blood. The enemy is a thief. He comes to take. But what did Jesus say? I have come to what? Give. I've come to give you life. Abundant life. He comes to steal. Jesus comes to give, and that's the one who is on your side. That is the one who fights for you. The enemy is a liar, but Jesus said what? I am the what? I'm the truth. I'm the truth. I'm the truth. Brothers and sisters, we must pick up the sword of the Spirit. We must get the Word of God. And when the enemy comes to accuse and talk about your record and my record, this is when we come to the Word of God. Because finally, what? Who does not keep a record? Only one. God keeps no record of our sins. No record. No record. And that's why we focus on God. And that's why we look to God.